They say at the heart of all Italian food is absolute simplicity. The best produce in season, homegrown or bought that day, cooked with love and passion. Welcome to Italian Food Safari. On this safari, black ink pasta. A recipe that uses dried salt cod, pork and fennel sausages. The secrets of a perfect risotto and the food of the angels, crostoli. When Italian fishermen came to Australia, they brought skills that were fundamental in opening up many key fishing areas right around our coastline. On the western coast, it was the Sicilians who put the port of Fremantle on the map. Claude Basili's grandfather, Calogero, was one of the first to come in 1905. Most of the, the uh, Italian fishermen come from the couple little towns, couple of Orlando and San Gravola. And they were the first fishermen in uh, Western Australia. You know, and they were largely Sicilians that came, weren't they? Yeah, largely Sicilians. And mm. they used to fish out of uh, Safety Bay and uh, virtually catch the wind with mm. the little sailing boats. And Much smaller than this, eh? Oh, most definitely. You know, they would be as small as uh, Jim's boat over there, you know. Mm. And uh, they were pretty hard in those days. Claude and a number of the descendants of the early fishing fleet raised enough money to erect a monument to them in the middle of the harbour. To sort of say thank you to our forefathers for what they did for Fremad or the fishing industry. One of the other legacies are some of the fishermen's own recipes using cuttlefish and squid. The most famous is what Claude calls black spaghetti, which he learned to cook as a young deckhand. Black spaghetti mm. originated in the town where I was born, Capo Lando in Sicily. Mm. And uh, it's a great delicacy there. So uh, my mum taught me and I love cooking it. It's revolting to look at, but it's absolutely <laughs> fantastic to it's eat. it's dark black, isn't oh, it? The teeth go black, but it's great. It's yeah. absolutely fantastic. It all starts with the ink sacs, which are carefully removed and set aside. In a large pot, Claude heats olive oil and adds diced onion. Chuck it in there like that. Then oh, chilli and chopped garlic. No, the garlic. He adds some pepper and salt. Beautiful. Passes the sauce, please. And a large bottle of homemade tomato passata. So now, before that comes to the boil, we have to put the ink bags in. Oh, look at that colour. Oh, beautiful. See that? Look at this. <gasps> mm. Beautiful, you know. This is the cuttlefish that we took the ink out of. Mm -hmm. These are quite small little cuttlefish, aren't they? Well, they are. And the smaller, the sweeter, Claude? Correct. Yeah. Even the, the ink off these ones is better than the, the bigger ones. We'll put a little bit of crushed pepper. That flavour goes through it. Oh, yeah. So what we do... Now, see that? That's ready now. That's so beautiful. What we do with this, we transfer it to there. And that then absorbs all that beautiful black. Yeah. Now it's about 10 minutes. Claude drains a large vat of spaghetti and mixes it with the rich black sauce. Oh, get ballet. Oh, look at that. Mm. 
we need to put some cheese. Bon appetito. Grazie. You're right, the black is, um, like, confronting. <laughs> it, it's but confronting, I... but, it, you know, it's all a matter how much you put in. Mm. You know, it, normally I would put a bit more black, but... Mmm. That's what magic. It's beautiful, rich and mellow. It's got a little hint of that chilli. Yeah. Beautiful. Much of the delicious heritage of Italy has been appreciated by a wider audience through pioneering restaurateurs who introduced their non-Italian customers to many new tastes. One of the veterans who did so much to educate his customers is Beppi Polesi, who started his restaurant in East Sydney in the late 1950s. Italian fishermen, they used to bring the catch of the night, fresh fish and so mm. on, and they used to cook it and introduce it as what it was. Mm. They refused everything, calamari, especially octopus. What, what would they sardines. say? Well, they said, no, 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 we use these to go fishing, we use it as a bite. Then I learned something, I said to myself, okay, I can cook everything in a sauce, you know, and I don't tell them what it was, and they loved it. And then I tell them what it was. And, and it was okay. So fantastic. <laughs> but that it took me about ten years to introduce the type of food that I knew mm. when I came to Australia. Beppi has now turned his attention to showing the delights of the dried salt cod called bacala. The bacala is soaked in cold water until it's plump again and boiled to soften the skin, which easily peals away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Beppi nice. removes any bones and pops the fish into a mixer, which shreds it perfectly. The pasta. Yeah, I shred. The depth of flavour, he adds chopped anchovies. Dried chilli flakes some crushed garlic, chopped chives, finely chopped celery leaves. Ah, that's one of your favourites. And parsley. Here is very important mm. to mix it dry be mm. before you add the oil. Got it. Very, very important. Beppi then slowly pours in olive oil. Mantecato is mean combined. It's, it's like mayonnaise, you know? It you is, yeah. When the mixture is thick and creamy, he adds a little stock made from the bones and skin of the fish. The manticato is finished with some lemon juice to add a fresh sharpness. OK. Let's try it. Thank you for introducing us to this. A beautiful flavour. Maybe, maybe, excuse me. Mm. A tiny bit of chilli. Ah, a little bit of chilli. I'll tell you what, that's marvellous. Okay, yeah. It is delicious. Oh, man. It's wonderful. Okay. Pleasure. Grazie. Little Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. A little kiss. Mwah. Mwah. That is the best of a lot. Oh, <laughs> you're very kind. Thank you. They say you can tell a good Italian butcher by the quality of his pork and fennel sausages, one of the staples of the kitchen used by themselves or as an ingredient in many dishes. Roger Ongarato runs the butcher shop set up by his father in the Melbourne suburb of Fitzroy. His popular pork and fennel sausages are from a treasured recipe handed down to him from his dad. So, Roger, the secret to good sausages? Well, it all starts with the pig. The best pigs always have a lot of fat. Um, the, they've got good, um, good colour, the meat's good colour. And uh, at the end of the day, we always prefer to have females, so I like that they're sweet tasting. Nice and sweet. Now, what sort of pork do you like to use? Do you have a particular preference? Well, predominantly, we like to use the um, Berkshire pork because it has a higher fat content. 
it's a slower growing animal, so yep. its its moisture content is much lower, yep. and that's one of the main things. We don't you don't want sausages to be bangers. Oh no, no. Yeah, so when you put them on the barbecue or in a fry pan, they just burst. They're uh, an old uh, English breed of pig, They're also rare. known as the black. Like that's pig. right, they're, rare, they're a rare breed. <laughs> All right, that's great. So today you're going to make some pork and fennel, fennel. seed sausages, which yep. is quite a traditional Italian style exactly of sausage. Right. Yep. And the sausages from the Veneto, which is where you're from, they're yep. quite big. They love oh, yeah. making their sausages oh, yeah, up exactly there. Oh, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. All right, so here's your pork. Now, talk to me about the cut of the animal that you use. Oh, what do you prefer using? Well, I prefer to use the shoulder. Yep. Um, because you've basically got good measure of fat and, um, and lean meat. Just once through the mincer? Just once. Yeah. You don't very... want to get it too mushed, do no. you? No, yeah. uh, we want it still to remain real Texture. rusty and rusty. Firstly, we just put it in our mixer. Now we end up putting in um, our spices. There's pepper, salt, nutmeg, and other related spices. And as hang you on, can hang see, on, hang on. You're not getting away with it that easily, Roger. You can't just do the other related spices. We want the secret here. What goes in there? Well, I'll tell you, Colonel Sanders never gave up <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky's, um, Kentucky's recipe, and neither will I, mate. This is a recipe we've had for at least um, 40 years. It's a family tradition, oh, yeah, it's yeah, a generational yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. My father in particular was a butcher in Italy, and yes. this and this um, came with him. Delightful. So, so, they smell good, they smell oh, fantastic. Yeah. Very so we end up putting that all in the in the mixer, and then we put in... Vino, vino Bianco. Yeah, put in some white wine. Now this has got a mix to become almost like a like a dough. Exactly right. So you get that emulsifying exactly action right. happening with the fat. And plus, so when you actually cook the sausage, it, it actually stays together. Binds together. It binds together. It doesn't just fall apart. Ready? She's looking good. Okay. As you can see, it's already started to bind really well. Oh yeah, you know? that's all. Beautifully bound, stuck yeah. together. And then before we really put it into a sausage, we, we've got to do the ultimate. What, are you going to eat it? We've got to it? taste it. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right. What do you think? She's Ready to spot go? spot on. She's spot on. Let me just make sure there. Gee, that is nice. Yeah. You would spread that on toast. Well, there. Yeah. <laughs> right? So we start, we put all the meat in the In the, in hopper. the hopper. Basically, with this machine here, it can, it can handle uh, natural hog casings or you sheep casings. You always use natural? Always use natural casings yes. when we're making um, a continental sausage. Gee, they look good. Oh, yeah. Is that just twisting it around It's then? actually twisting. There's a mechanism inside. Fantastic. Now, what do you do? You just store well, them like then, that? or? Yeah, no, no, no. Then we just um, link the sausage. It's like tying shoelaces. And look at that. They are good enough to wear, they look beautiful enough to wear out. Oh, that's hey? it. It's jewellery, look at that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that's magnificent. Thank you, Roger. No worries. You're welcome. Bit of rice. The Italians started growing rice in earnest in the north of Italy in the 19th century, and it wasn't long before the dish risotto was born. The rice toasted in a pan before adding hot liquid. Making good risotto has become an art form. One of its masters is top Sydney chef Alessandro Pavoni, who's from Brescia in the north of Italy. He won a national risotto competition in the mid-1990s and hasn't looked back. At his restaurant Omeggio on Sydney's Middle Harbour, Alessandro's masterful risotto is always in demand. And he loves to cook it, as it reminds him of home. Tell me, you're from the risotto part of I'm Italy? I'm from the risotto part of Italy, which is the north. How many times a week would you have risotto? Uh, Sometimes two, three times a week. Usually my mom cooks it in Friday, every Friday, mm. with the saffron, which is uh, very typical. Beautiful. I'm using one rice, which I'm very proud of, which is Aquarello. This is also one year age, and they aged it one year to stabilize the starch. So in the 18 minutes of cooking, slow cooking process, the starch is released very slowly, and it keeps al dente, though. A bit of olive oil in there. 
Alessandro's sausage and pea risotto starts with chopped Italian pork sausages being sealed in a pan and the excess fat drained off. We don't want to cook it all the way through. We want to mm. just seal it a little bit and then we will finish the cooking in the risotto. Red wine is heated and saffron threads added to steep and release their flavour. Put my olive oil in the pan. Onions, for, you can use eschalot if you wish. I like eschalot too. You need to put quite a bit of onion, they give a good flavour. I want to cook them all, but I don't want to make any, any colour. Yeah. So I add my rice. And now we do the tostatura, signora. <laughs> the, the tostatura. The tostatura is we want to make it very hot. Now I'm going to add my warm wine. So if it, this was fresh. So you get all the rice now to evaporate. Now I have a stock here, which I've made before. There is one chicken there, carrots, celery, onion, a bit of thyme. So how do you work out the amount of liquid to rice? Uh, it's about uh, four parts of uh, stock, but uh, it depends on the rice that you use a lot. So you don't stir from this stage? No, I don't. Why? I don't mix, otherwise it will stick. So what I do now, put a little bit of pea, and I just want to put it for the flavor, because otherwise they'll be overcooking. And I'm going to put a little bit of sauce, but not too much, otherwise uh, they're going to be too overcook. So it's important the times that you put things in. If you yes. put them in now, you get more flavour. Yeah, I put this part now for the flavour and mm. some after for the texture as well. Mm. And my stock. It's all about the stocks. Mm. So vegetarian, use vegetarian stocks. If I do pumpkin risotto, I use pumpkin in the stocks. But it's, you spend as much time on your stock as your risotto. If the stock is right, you're going to be sure that the result mm. is going to be good. Mm. So I put the rest of the sausage in. Now we can start mixing. See, it's ah. not stick anymore. See, look. So it's quite liquid at this stage, Alex. Yeah, but we're nearly ready to go, huh? You like this amount of liquid? Yeah. Perfect, OK. Wow. <laughs> so you take it right off the stove? Right off the stove. I add my butter. I need to be generous with butter. Generous with butter, OK. Parmigiano Reggiano. Only the best. Only the best. A bit of parsley in this case. Uh huh. Then I have my olive oil. And olive oil. So this is this is where you really put the finishing touches yeah. on. Ah. And then the emulsification. This is. <laughs> How you call it? So them? it all emulsifies with a special toss. More oil. Yeah. Yeah. It's good for you. It is good for you. Okay, we're ready. So in Italy, what you do in, in the restaurants, or I've learned, like this. It so needs to be sprayed. Otherwise, it would overcook the bottom. Fascinating. That's it. So in Italian, this particular risotto is called? Risotto alla pavone. La pavone. <laughs> oh, it's your very own. <laughs> With sausage and pig. Yeah. Buon appetito. Grazie. <laughs> so you feel the grains? Mmm. It's nice, huh? Okay. I feel like this is the first true risotto I've ever had. Mm. It is beautiful. Each grain is... You can taste it in your mouth. Mmm. Yeah. Beautiful you know, flavour. There is Barbera inside. You can have a glass of Barbera with that. and mm. Very nice. And I'm, there's a good amount of saffron here too. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Very nice, very nice. Mm. Many of Italy's favourite sweets are not baked but fried. As well as the luscious cannoli, crostoli have a special place in the hearts of Italians. They're a fried dough with a sprinkling of icing sugar. Chef Vanessa Martin is a devotee. Her family is from the Veneto region. At her restaurant Il Piave in Sydney's inner suburbs, Vanessa serves many northern dishes, but saves crostily as her treat for home. 
Vanessa Crosteli, why are they so popular? Because once you eat one, you have to eat the whole plate. Oh, it's, really? It's sort of like <laughs> an addictive taste, I think, and because they're fried, things taste lovely fried. So, <laughs> fried and sugar. Fried and sugar, yep. And are they from your region, from the Venice region of Italy? Well, I think they are, but I think everybody claims them as their own. Um, I say they're mine because we use grappa and we're from the north and that's where grappa originated from. So, mm. But everybody makes them differently and this is just our recipe that we, mm. that we do. Vanessa mixes plain flour with an Italian baking powder that's pre-mixed with vanilla sugar. Some caster sugar yep. is added. We'll always with baking, use caster sugar. Mm. And butter. About three tablespoons. She zests an orange and a lemon. Okay, if you want to put extra vanilla. I reckon you can never have too much oh, vanilla. vanilla. Yeah. And that's the vanilla paste, isn't vanilla it? Vanilla paste, yep. And you just make it to a fine breadcrumb. You could do it by hand, but this... No, oh, gee, well, too much work. That's right. And then into a bowl. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to, like, pasta. You just make a little well. Vanessa adds and three eggs and a generous slug of grappa. Nice. Ah. Nice slurp. And oh, then and a knife. With a knife, she stirs the mix in a figure-eight motion, then uses her hands to knead the mix into a dough. This is the part that I like, but a lot of people don't. Getting your hands in yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, it's great. So who taught you this recipe? Well, this is my grandmother's recipe. My grandmother's 99. Yeah. So to, wow. get, it, to get it out of her, is like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> So just sprinkle a little bit on the... That's it. See, so one nice elastic dough. Mm. You smell. That smells wonderful. Gee, there's a lot of grappa in there, though. Yeah. And you rest it, like every dough, rest it for about half an hour, not in the fridge. Right. And that's ready. So it's going to... A little bit different, it's all nice and relaxed. Oh, it still smells wonderful. Yeah. So you just take, cut a piece, don't go too generous to the first one because you've got to put, feed it through the machine. And then on the wider setting, mm -hmm. you're going to... That is fantastic. So this is eight times. Eight times. So you fold it over and yeah. you put either the fold down or the corner down, so any air pockets. Out. So that's why you fold it, to yes. get any yep. air out. And it's working the dough to make it smoother. And most of the time I forget how many times I've done it, so... <laughs> it's not the grappa either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then now we're going to make the thickness. So okay. you just bring it down a notch. Yeah. Fine. And it's so perfumed as well. We traditionally, using the roller, we put the little... Oh, now you put little... Slits in it. Uh-huh. Ah, so that's what helps it curl a little yeah. bit. God, they're lovely, aren't they? They're mm. so delicate and so oh, pretty. Mm. <laughs> now, the, now frying, yeah. Oh, pretty. You can hear when it's right, can't yeah. you? See the bubbles? Mm. You gotta love bubbles. And don't put too many in there you can't handle, otherwise they're gonna burn and you won't be able to get them out quick enough. So the bubbles give you the, the great texture in your mouth. Yes. Wow, they're really quick, aren't they? Yep. So no more than pale golden. Yeah. 
icing sugar. Gosh. Mmm. Mmm. Wow. They are magic, aren't they? Well, I made them, so I have to say they are. Mmm. <laughs> but they don't taste fried. No, they don't. They dangerously don't taste fried. That's why they're addictive. Mmm. Yes. Eat more. That's right. Mmm. And go to the gym tomorrow. Oh my gosh. This is so light. All those little bubbles. Mmm, mmm, mmm. On our next Italian safari, buffalo mozzarella, beautiful suckling lamb, and a full-on Calabrian feast. Oh. 